let's let's get started. So welcome all to this session. Um, as you will know, this is uh, the session uh, work, uh, called Working with Software and Data. And uh, first of all, welcome you all and uh, welcome to the speakers. I will uh, moderate this session and just a few organizational things first. Um, we have one and a half hour for this session. So we have presentations and a few questions after each and then uh, a bit of time towards the end to look into a few more questions and whatever comes up in terms of comments and uh, suggestions. So please be aware that this is a session which is recorded. All slides and the recordings uh, will be made available afterwards. Um, uh, slides typically through Zenodo and the recordings through the conference website. And please turn to the chat for putting comments and questions to the speakers. Um, yeah, and we will we will look into them uh, later. Uh, and if the speakers have a half eye on this, you can of course uh, pick one or two after directly after your presentation. And if you have any technical issues, please check your internet connection or rejoin the Zoom. Uh, but also you might turn to uh, Yelena who's around um, hosting from the technical side. Um, so put, put a question into the chat. Um, so uh, enjoy the session. Uh, we have um, three presentations. The first one will be on data citation in the humanities and social sciences. Uh, this will be presented by Barbara McGillivray from the University of Cam Cambridge. She also has an affiliation at the Elaine Turing Institute in the United Kingdom. Uh, Nicolas Larousse um, from Humanum in France and Dan Broder, who is involved in Clarin and works uh, in the Netherlands. Our second speaker is Katie Wilson. She speaks about the Curtin Knowledge um, Knowledge, um, Curtin Open Knowledge Initiative, uh, which is about uh, sharing data on a scholarly research performance. And our third speaker is Neil Philip Jong Hong from the University of Edinburgh. Uh, he speaks about recognizing the value of software and how libraries can help uh, with the adoption of software citation. And I would like to congratulate, congratulate him. Um, on um, a Libre Innovation Award, um, which was awarded um, to uh, three selected uh, submissions for the conference. So let's let's now move on to our first presentation. And um, the floor is yours. And I think it's Barbara who will start. And I stop sharing now and also stop my video for now. Thank you, Birgit. And uh, I'm going to share my screen now. Can you all see uh, the full screen? Um, yes. So, um, yeah, this is a, a collaboration that started in the context of the shock project, of which you'll hear more about uh, later. And um, as Birgit said, I'm here um, wearing my hat as researcher. Um, I'm a computational linguist. Um, but I'm also editor-in-chief of the Journal of Open Humanities Data, so I'll um, be wearing these two hats uh, today. I'll hand over to uh, Dan for the first uh, slide. Yeah, thank you, uh, Barbara. Um, yeah, um, so I think while the content of this, this first slide is uh, not specific for the social sciences of humanities and um, nor is it very specific for data citation. I think it's important to uh, stay to remember from time to time what's the background of and our motivation uh, of our drive to improve our uh, uh, data management practices and uh, research infrastructure. Uh, the two big motivators are open science and open knowledge. So open science is uh, the desire for openness of all aspects of uh, research and is especially important with respect to uh, uh, reproduci reproducibility of uh, research. And open knowledge uh, uh, is the desire to make this research results uh, similarly open and uh, accessible. The FAIR principles uh, 
which I'm sure you heard about, it's uh, impossible to escape them, uh, help us with achieving both, that find findability, accessibility, interoperability, and reusability. Findability and reusability are, I think, uh, uh, quite uh, uh, important with respect to uh, data citation. And uh, all the stakeholders uh, seem to like it. So uh, we, uh, we cheer them. Next slide, please, Barbara. So when we uh, <clears throat> talk about fair principles, uh, uh, those principles have to prove to be very successful uh, with uh, respect to guiding uh, strategies and implementation. Um, um, they're also very important in the shock project that Barbara already mentioned. Um, so uh, the shock project is uh, a European project. It's uh, the uh, current thematic cluster project for the social sciences and uh, humanities. Um, main goals are uh, for the SSH to claim and build their part of the European open science cloud and maximum reuse to open science and the FAIR principles. Um, shock is uh, why we are here. It's uh, the ground where we are gotten to know one another. Uh, both Nicolas and myself uh, have an official role within shock and we collaborate with Barbara on uh, library connected topics as for instance, uh, data citation. I should add that Shock is uh, present at the Libre conference also, also uh, with other events. Um, this afternoon, I think there is a workshop called uh, Shocking Drama. And tomorrow there is a poster about the Shock Open Marketplace. And I think then I have to turn over to you, Barbara. Yeah. So uh, thank you, Dan. Um, so Dan has given you um, an idea of the, of the landscape in, where we, in which we are um, operating, but there are specificities, as was mentioned, uh, to social sciences and humanities. The attention to research data has uh, grown uh, gradually in, in these um, areas alongside the sciences, of course. And that's um, thanks to a number of positive uh, factors. The increased availability of digital collections, thanks to um, big digitization efforts that started uh, a couple of decades ago, uh, but also the increased availability of data intensive methods or computational methods. So we have emerging areas within the humanities, um, or of course, digital humanities, but even more recently, um, computational humanities uh, initiatives. And we also have increased availability of born digital data, um, dynamic data from social networks, for example, human generated or machine generated web content, which are widely used for research purposes. Um, so we have a very rich uh, and diverse uh, landscape of, of, in terms of data types, including, of course, uh, cultural heritage uh, collections. And we also have, uh, share, sharing with the sciences, increased uh, number of uh, data professionals and data stewards in, in libraries, um, hired to, to be in, actively involved in this process. So all these factors are contributing to growing attention to the data, um, which comes with new challenges and new needs, uh, infrastructural, methodological, um, and uh, ethical as well. And, and I said that we, we have a variety of different data types. Here's just an, an overview of uh, the kinds of, of, of data sets we, we deal with in the humanities because there is this assumption that it's all about text, but that's uh, not the case. We, of course, have uh, map uh, images, um, video, audio, um, database, uh, text, um, multi-modal um, data set. So it's, it's a very rich and varied uh, landscape. And of course, when we talk about humanities and data sciences, we talk about, um, and um, it's social sciences, we talk about a very uh, broad set of disciplines. Um, and looking historically, um, there is definitely been a longer tradition for quantitative uh, methods in social sciences, but the humanities have uh, also had a long, uh, long experience with uh, especially text-based um, uh, digital methods. 
think about computational linguistics and um, digital humanities, uh, you know, whose pioneer, um, Father Roberto Busa, uh, started his work uh, in the middle of the 20th century. Um, what is um, different, though, is that the focus historically has been on the final uh, publication of uh, all the, the research. Um, so typically uh, in the form of the book. Um, so rather than uh, focusing on uh, publishing the data that uh, underpinned the whole research process, um, the focus has been on the final output. But now we do have access to the whole uh, creation process. So we have new opportunities for uh, exploring and um, these, um, these new resources. And, and data um, publication um, itself um, isn't particularly new, but um, recently um, whole um, landscape and uh, ecosystem of, of outputs has emerged. So, uh, we, of course, have the step of depositing and publishing the data, typically in open repositories that assign a digital object or the identifier. And this interacts with the step of documenting the data, so um, documenting the intellectual organization of the data. But we, um, we recently have um, the, the availability of data papers. So these are peer-reviewed publications that describe the data sets that have been deposited and credit their create creators. So that's a relatively new in, um, uh, trend, uh, especially in the humanities and social sciences. And um, data papers are really meant to, um, to give uh, recognition to the work uh, that went into creating uh, the data in the first place. Um, and data papers and the data sets um, tend to link uh, to each other so that they, they reinforce um, the availability and the findability of the data. Um, and in this uh, emerging um, field, uh, we also have a number of data journals or journals dedicated to publishing data papers. In the humanities, we have two main ones. Um, the Journal of Open Humanities Data is the one that I, I leave, so I know more about it. Um, so it, it's only uh, a few years old, so it, it, and it's still uh, quite small in size, but it's growing rapidly, showing that there is definitely a growing interest in this area. Uh, and it publishes two types of papers, that, the really short data papers that describe a data set and longer narratives as well, um, discussing the challenges um, of, of dealing with uh, data in the humanities. Um, so having introduced um, the questions of, the, of data publication, I'll hand over um, again uh, to, to Nicola um, to talk about data citation in SSH. Thank you, Barbara. Uh, so as it was said before, it was mentioned by Dan and by Barbara, uh, you know, we have specificities in uh, humanities, in so social science and humanities, and uh, it's evolving rapidly uh, thanks to the funders that uh, now they they want to know what we are doing with data, but uh, for the time being, during uh, maybe the last 20 years, you know, publishing data is, was not really a, a good, uh, good thing to do for your career, you know. You can see uh, a French review in archaeology, you can see the data, it's uh, on, the, uh, on the cover, but it was not really published, it, it was not really important. The, the focus was more on the final product, the final product is generally a publication, and more often a book, and uh, this was the general way of having a good career in, uh, as a researcher in the uh, humanities. And uh, there are now things are evolving, as Barbara said, and there are a lot of, um, we have a, the specificities, we have, we, have, we have a lot of different uh, types of data. And uh, so it's diff sometimes it's difficult to cite. And, also, the type of data evolve rapidly now because uh, you, you can see people are using LIDA, for instance, to do some research. So it was not the case uh, only three years ago. So there are a lot of initiative to try to cite data, but it's not really, there is no real standard. And uh, so we can, we can say that to 
we have made a survey of, uh, of what is going on in uh, SSH in general. And we, we can say that we have more communities of practice. And uh, also, this is something very important. So maybe it's, uh, it's obvious, but it's not, it was not obvious maybe five or 10 years ago that to cite data, you need infrastructure and good infrastructure. And in SSH, they are also relatively, relatively new. And uh, for instance, in my case in France, uh, I'm working in French infrastructure for SSH and then it's, uh, we are developing very, rapid, very rapidly, but uh, 10 years ago, it was just uh, the very beginning of that. So we need to have infrastructure to, to cite data. So next uh, slide, please. And uh, Dan presented Shock, the Shock project. So uh, what are we doing in Shock uh, regarding data citation? And uh, I'm leading a task about data citation and what we try to do in that task and what we are doing, not what we try to do, is to, uh, we have done the recommendations for uh, researchers, for project managers, for engineers from a data librarian also, and uh, which has, uh, who as Barbara said, are now heavily involved in data curation and uh, building data management plan and so on. And uh, the idea is to, to take uh, what exists. We are not going to reinvent the wheel. So the first 11 citation principle, and we put some specificities for SSH. And uh, so it will be published in, in, uh, on the shop website, uh, I think, uh, after the summer. And the other thing that we are trying to do, and uh, now it's, I must say, trying because it's, uh, it's a prototype right now. And uh, we, we are thinking about making citation actionable. And you know, there are a lot of work uh, around the data to do things uh, that are, to make things actionable. For instance, in RDA, you have, uh, a group that is working on the uh, actionability of data management plan, for instance. And so the idea in a uh, shock, we are building a, a citation infrastructure. That means that we have repositories and we try to grab information from existing citation or big new ones, and then enrich them uh, automatically from different sources and uh, manually with the semantic annotation. After that, we standardized and we have, uh, uh, right now it's a prototype and we are still developing this prototype. We have a prototype to publish a citation in a standardized way and uh, to make it machine actionable. So we have an API and we have also uh, a read for humans. And then, that makes uh, the, cite the citation uh, more easy to disseminate. And as Barbara said, we are, we are fostering the visibility of uh, data in, uh, in humanities in that way. I'm finished. So that's over to Dan uh, for me the again. last slides. So, <laughs> yeah. So Nicolas has uh, shown you uh, what is currently being done in shock. And uh, I think it will certainly take us further, for instance, uh, with respect to having actionable data citation. But uh, I would also like to tempt you to think a bit further ahead and uh, see uh, what can be the future of uh, data publication and citation. Um, the technology has, of course, been uh, um, improving enormously, and we have uh, these. There is a huge potential for uh, data creation, processing, and uh, uh, sharing. Um, but still, um, from my perspective, the uh, data citation practices are still mainly based on the traditional model, the model of data, of paper citing paper citing paper. And I think more complex uh, collaborative and um, dynamic workflows are certainly possible. 
and also needed when you're looking at uh, different uh, types of data and the ways of how data are created. So using distributed and dynamic data sources as for instance, social media that has already been mentioned and uh, creating virtual collection of uh, uh, heterogeneous, uh, but also distributed data. Important here is, I think, uh, proper data identification. So the use of persistent identifiers, uh, descriptions of such data, and provenance tracking. And uh, not only at the end, but the whole data life cycle. Next slide, please. And this slide is a bit about, uh, let's say, discussion uh, with uh, library communities. It uh, holds uh, uh, all debatable uh, statements, uh, sometimes even, uh, I think, controversial. But the, the essence of it is that uh, currently uh, librarians are involved or considering to get involved mainly uh, with the end product, so papers and perhaps the end result data sets. While I think there is also a need for uh, describing and, and archiving the uh, transient, transient, let's call them transient results. The question is, can libraries, can librarians get involved there? Uh, can they go beyond caring only for the end results? They are already involved in uh, storing the project results, papers and data sets. Uh, they are already involved of training and facilitating uh, researchers uh, with respect to the principles I mentioned on my first slide. They're already involved in uh, meta science, so providing, for instance, important information uh, to funders. Uh, but for them to get involved also in um, aspects of the data life cycle, it might be that the, uh, the distance, uh, conceptual but also actual distance, between the libraries and the research lab uh, uh, is too big. I don't know. It's uh, for me an interesting uh, uh, subject to debate with the librarians. It's my last slide, and I think last slide of our presentation, Barbara, Nicola. Yes. So happy to take any questions. And... Okay. Thank you very much, um, all of you. So. The audience, um, any questions? Please don't hesitate to put your questions into the chat. Um, so far, I can't see any, but um, that should not <laughs> make you worried about putting forward your question. Um, I mean, you have not, um, one question for me, I mean, you have not really elaborated how um, citations do actually look like, or if you think there are different types, perhaps, or, um, but now a question comes in. So Miriam Mertens uh, asking if you're working on best practices for citing dynamic data. I think it was. Sorry, Nicolas, you would better pose to uh, answer that question. I no, think no, no, the workshop. No, no, uh, no, but uh, no, there is, a, you can mention that there was a LDA working group about citation of dynamic data. Mm -hmm. So it was not only for, uh, for this kind of data. Right, yeah. But uh, yes, we are working on, uh, on that. And sometimes it's, uh, Sometimes it's very easy because uh, sometimes they, they just grab information from uh, from the social media and they put it in, in a repository in an infrastructure, so it's easy. And sometimes it's quite it's more difficult because uh, there are no real, uh, as Dan said, uh, PIDs, for instance, for this kind of uh, media, and uh, they are evolving. They are sometimes moving. So yes, it's a real challenge. And there are a lot of research in SSH that are using this kind of data. So we, we put in our recommendation some, uh, some recommendation from uh, dynamic data, but it's, uh, it's a work in progress, uh, nicely. 
Yeah, and I can add from my point of view, um, with in data journals, um, the, the the one I, I do, I do I do increasingly get these kinds of questions from authors because mm. currently uh, the requirement is to deposit the data in a repository, and so it gets a DOI and it has to be a static. Uh, frozen version of the data set um, because uh, that ensures that it can be checked and uh, that the description that appears in the data paper and is of, of that frozen um, thing. So, but um, I acknowledge that this is increasingly uh, a topic of discussion. So um, I think data journals will, will have to um, look into ways of accommodating um, this, maybe changing some of the, of the uh, practices. But there are open questions like how do you check the quality or the consistency of dynamic data if you if it, if it keeps changing? Um. Yeah, maybe I can add to that with, with uh, respect to dynamic data. Versioning is of course uh, enormously um, important. Uh, and uh, there we might learn something from how uh, our software developers uh, uh, do this uh, correctly. Um, Neil will probably tell us a bit about that later on. Um, so there are enough, how do you say, inspiration uh, sources. But um, I think that uh, with respect to versioning, especially in the social sciences and humanities, that type of data, it's also not always possible to actually qualify the relationships between uh, all the um, different uh, versions, uh, especially if you look how, uh, let's say, some, some textual corpora came uh, to be, the relationships between those are not always clear, but they still need to be noted down. It's still important to know there is some kind of a relationship, um, yeah. Um, and a related topic, maybe uh, it's uh, in SSH, we also have sometimes a need to cite not a record, for instance, or a digital object, but a part of the digital object. So this mm -hmm. is also a topic that is in progress. There are some techniques to do that, for instance, uh, technological answers like uh, tripod IF, for instance, for images. But uh, for sound, uh, it's not really stabilized. Stabilized, and I say you you need to have a sort of a, a workaround to cite a part of a record, a recording, for instance. And for video, it's the same. So we have we have, we have also this kind of uh, of, uh, of needs, uh, and I think for data journal, it's a challenge to to, to cite only a part of a recording, for instance. Yeah, it seems like both, I mean, you zoom in and you zoom out in terms of smaller subsets or, or items in there. Yeah. And then the collections, which you also need to kind of specify site and for reproducibility to make clear what you have actually selected <laughs> and then worked on. So maybe- there, And there are standards out there that, that mm -hmm. how do you say, that give you, uh, you say that, that are good that, that uh, allow this to happen at least in a technical sense but it's uh, it's difficult to get them um, how do you say implemented in the in the research uh, workflows mm -hmm. okay thank you again so let's um, move on to our next presentation so it's uh, now Katie Wilson from Curtin University presenting uh, on the Curtin Knowledge Open Knowledge Initiative. So okay, take it thank away. You. Thank you. Um, just going to share my screen. Okay, do you see it? Yeah. Yes, looks good. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, uh, I'd just like to say that I'm presenting on behalf of the Curtin Open Knowledge Initiative project team, whose whose names. You see on the screen there, um, the project is based at Curtin University in Western Australia. And um, I'd also just like to acknowledge the Wajak Noongar people on whose unceded lands Curtin University is located. And I acknowledge the elders past, present, emerging and future and pay my respects to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples who inhabit the land. Um, <clears throat> So the, the project um, is, 
been running since 2018 as a strategic research project at Curtin University. It's located in the Faculty of Humanities, but has quite an interdisciplinary team. We have data scientists, um, statisticians, and also critical scholars. And so the, our focus is gathering and analyzing research data to understand institutional research output in terms of open access or open science, performance, um, collaborations, citation advantages, and publisher and funder performance. We also analyze demographic and geographic diversity that is for, for workforces and research production. And we work with libraries and other stakeholders uh, to build a community coalition and I'll be this is what I'll be talking about. The map you can see uh, on the screen is uh, an indication of the the where the data we work with is located so we're we're quite a uh, we aim to be a global project. Um, <clears throat> so the project grew out of a critique of the bibliometric measure, the limited bibliometric measures and the underlying assumptions of dominant, university, world university rankings. Um, they are somewhat limited in some, in some of their sources. So our approach is to be quite, uh, to use multiple sources where we can. Um, so we use a number of sources to obtain bibliographic data, open access data, and as well as affiliation and citation data. Some, and some of those you can see on the screen there. <clears throat> so we've working, we're working on quite a large scale. We've built a, a data set of um, 12 trillion items or more. I think at that point, 12 trillion becomes uh, not quite so meaningful. So it's probably more than that now, but we, um, we're we working with institutions, over 18,000 institutions in 192 countries. Um, and we gather and capture the output data from these institutions. And um, this enables us to, through our analysis, we can then present, analyze, and view the data from different perspectives. So we have, um, we're able to provide institutional views, we can provide country views, we can look at how funders perform in terms of um, open access, open knowledge, we can look at publishers, and we can also provide views, group views of cons uh, consortia and other groupings. So the goals of the project are based around looking as an alternative to how universities comply, who comply with world ranking systems, require researchers to publish in sources that are indexed by the major commercial bibliographic databases. So a core goal of the knowledge of the Open Knowledge Initiative is to move beyond global rankings and to focus more on openness and research as an alternative way of looking at um, research output and understanding what the openness can pr provide. So we aim to facilitate dialogue um, within institutions and also within countries and within groupings and to understand the workforce diversity and diversity in, in research output. We work with, um, we've worked with some of our earliest ongoing conversations have been with academic libraries and research libraries to develop the project ideas and the feedback and, and testing. Um, we found that um, we, we gathered a large amount of data and, start, and we're analyzing data and it was quite hard to, to be able to um, um, communicate this to, to people, but we began to develop interact, interactive dashboards, visual dashboard tools that have made a huge difference to how we can present the information. So because a lot of it is um, we're, we're sharing the information with people at different levels, academics, faculty, researchers, um, higher education administrators, senior executives in universities, and who often don't have time to understand all the all the detail, but in order to, in, we found that with the dashboards that we pro, we developed, we were able to present a large amount of data um, and communicate this data. So we've also consulted with academic libraries um, in reviewing the dashboards, um, and and this involved really seeking feedback from communities who use and understand the data in order to extend out of our own data bubble. 
library staff are central to the use of analytical tools and writing reports and through educational practices. Um, so here's an example. This is actually our, our second iteration of, of our dashboard. Um, this is one we developed for Curtin University. And we, um, we have, this is the front page. Um, it starts off with um, just a summary of metrics for the last 20 years. So we look at the total outputs for the university, published outputs, the publishers, the number of citations and the unique funders. And then we move over to the, um, the, the metrics for 2020, which is a breakdown of the open access output or the open science output. So we have 40% of open accessible output and of those 29% are, are open via a repository that is green open access. 26% um, via a publisher gold open access and 6.7% via um, hybrid, which is uh, open and published in a paywall journal, but with um, a fee. And that's the opening page. And we can also then go to other um, aspects of the, of the database. So there are several other pages, which several other dashboards, which provide more detail on open access and citations, output types, publishers and funders, um, and collaborations and disciplines. So this is an example of just some of the data from the collaborating collaborators um, dashboard. So on the left hand side, we have we show the the top collaborators over this over the selected time range for the last twenty years. So those are the, the institutions with whom Curtin University collaborates the most. Most I think they're all in Australia, which is not surprising. Um, but on the right hand side here, we show in, in the, the map, the global view of all the institutions that the university cooperate, co uh, collaborates with. Um, and so each dot there represents an institution. And as we go within the, the collaboration that's dashboard, we can also zero in and drill down into who in particular countries, which institutions we collaborate with. So um, as, we, as we developed our first version of the dashboard, we worked with, um, we invited members of the University Library Associations in Australia and Aotearoa New Zealand to review their institutional data and the interface and also how, how the data can be applied and used in, the, in their institutions. Um, and this provided some really useful information and insights into research of scholarly publishing and practices. Um, and here are some of the comments that, um, that some of the respondents provided. They've found just bringing all the data together in one place and presenting it visually was very, very helpful. And um, they also noted that you know, the usefulness of the data, the dashboard's ability to provide a new, new perspective on existing data and also to provide some, some new data that they hadn't really looked at before. Um, the last point here talks about citation data. So we have a slide, um, we have a graph here on for showing the citation advantage, a higher citation advantage for open access publications. The, um, the middle column here is shows that for the for 18 since 2000, 2000 2018 for Curtin University, there were the average citations for open access publications was 12.67. Um, but for non open access, it was 9.12, the average. So this um, this is information that the that people often aren't aware of. It's, so we bring this kind of analysis together and um, present it within the within the dashboard. Um, we also have our two public dashboards available through the Koki website. The first one is based on uh, at a country level, providing open access um, information on output by country. So this is for Australia. It shows um, here over the last 20 years, the, 
the development of open access output from Australia. So the gray at the top of the bars is non-open and the orange is open. Um, we see a little bit of a dip in 2020 and we, we attribute that to um, uh, the embargoes that quite a few journals place on, on making ma uh, material available through repositories. Um, and then also down below, we break down the open access into the, into the different types. The second public dashboard is the Koki Research Funding Dashboard. And what we take here um, funders who are acknowledged in publications and we break those down. We analyze, group them together for each country and we can show then what, who are the major funders for, for each country for over the last few years. So um, this is the Netherlands and we, we can see the, over the last five years, who are the five major funders. Um, and again, we can break that down into more detail. And the second aspect that we show, it's not on this graph, but um, we can also look at the, we also have the analysis of the ratio of domestic funding to international funding um, by, by each country. And the other area that we focus on is looking at um, diversity. And so we have two perspectives here. One is um, that we aim for a wider geographic scope in, in the research cover, coverage in our analysis. Um, and we also examine diversity in, in higher education workforces. So the, um, I'm going to show a little um, 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 video here, um, or illustration really, animation of, um, open access over time by region. And this shows um, some, some of the geographic diversity. We break it down into regions and we can see the, the movement of, of the change in, in the regions over the last 10 years. So let me just, um, I will have to just change that to get that showing. Um, let's find where it is, there it is. Okay, now can you see the can you see the illustration, the animation? Yep. Yes. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so we have um, just move that over there. So it starts in 2010 and it goes through to um, 2020, and I'm just going to stop it there. So the each dot here represents an institution, and so the the um, brown is Latin America. So, um, and what we're showing here is on the, on the vertical axis, we're showing the total gold that is the publisher open access percentage. And on the, ver the horizontal axis across the bottom is the green. So that's repository open access. And so we can see for each country, but also by institution, how much is produced, how much of output is green open access and how much is gold. Um, so for Latin America, there's some very strong growth here, um, particularly in gold, this one, this is for 2014. So um, this, and we attribute this to the, the development of the Cielo platform for Latin America, which um, has, which provides um, a repository and platform for Latin American research publications. So they they they're very high in, in their gold output, um, their publisher output. Um, Europe is green here. So we have individual institutions um, mostly leaning more to the green. So repository open access. Um, blue is, is North America also kind of more to the, the green focus at this, at this stage. Um, the orange is Asia and pink is Africa and black is Australia. So if we keep going and we'll just see what happens through the year. So we're moving through now and it stops at 2020. Um, so for Latin America, the uh, move right over here to, the, to, to gold 
and Europe continues the climb through, through green. Um, but what's interesting is to be able to look at some of the, the tiny dots. The, the dot represents an institution and each, um, the size of the dot re represents the total outputs for that year. But this is the University of Gondar in Ethiopia. So we have some quite strong um, open access here. Also, this is Jimma University also in Ethiopia. And over here on the left in the gold right, very high in the gold is um, a, a number of universities from Indonesia who have, that have very high um, gold open access. Again, they have quite strong national policies there. Um, and uh, so I'll just play it again, let's start again. So we start at 2010 and it's quite fun to watch the, the change. Um, so that's uh, kind of, a, yeah, indicates that we are trying to cover a, a wide range, a wide geographic range. And it's just very interesting to see that evolution of, of open access over time. So let me go back to the um, presentation, if I can find it, there it is. Okay. Um, the other aspect of diversity is we're interested in who is involved in, in research, um, production, teaching and, and even management in institutions. So we analyze publicly available demographic data to look at how universities how university workforces reflect their student body, their local communities and their populations. And this is all publicly available data that we analyze um, where available, and not all countries make that data available, but where available, we also include this in the dashboards. Um, and it uh, allows, although it's publicly available, often institutions and individual members are not necessarily aware of their own workforce diversity or, or the, the, the breakdown and how that looks. So um, just a couple of examples here. Again, Curtin University, where I work, we, we looked at the um, gender breakdown, men and women in academic and non-academic positions for from, 20, from 2000, 2001 to 2018. And by, um, by 2018, the overall number of women had reached 57%, but only 46% of those academic staff were, of academic staff were women. And the largest number of um, women were in non-academic positions. And so this, in particular for academic women, the, the percentage decreases in higher as levels become higher. Um, and that's a pattern that we've, we've found in other countries as well. Um, we also just took um, 44 universities from the UK and analyzed these again for, for gender, women and men. And we found that um, mostly the higher percentages of women are in the, the newer. So we've done this by grouping. So we've grouped the UK universities into um, things like the Million Plus and Alliance, which are newer universities and Russell, the Russell grouping, which are the older, um, more established um, universities or research intensive universities. So again, it's most, most of the Russell universities are, uh, have below 50% women. So the women are in the blue and men in the red. And it's the, the newer universities that tend to have slightly higher percentages of women on staff. This is academic, this one is academic staff. So, um, Moving forward, um, as I mentioned, Koki began as, as a strategic research project. Um, it's funded by Curtin University, continues to be funded, although every year is, we, we don't know <laughs> what the next year will bring. Um, we're supplemented by some grants, but in order to move forward and maintain the, the development, we are developing a, a community coalition and we're sharing um, resources. So this enables us to um, 
bring together stakeholders in the in the open knowledge um, and scholarly communication environment. It's um, a mix of higher education consortia, funders, research managers, uh, and libraries. And we're working to just continue growing and sustaining the, the, the open data asset that we've developed. At the same time, we um, are sharing the project data and uh, the raw data and software and our visual dashboard code. So those are all um, open source for others to use. Um, so just to find, if you wish to find out a little more about our project, here are some links to our recent work. So some of the dashboards, uh, some of our, our publications. And um, we also have a book, our forthcoming book out very soon. This, uh, this is called Open Knowledge Institutions, Reinventing Universities. It's, it's, it started, it was produced by a group of 13 authors at a book sprint in 2018 and um, in five days we, we wrote a book. Um, it's been revised since then um, but now it's about to be published. Um, it will be available as a, as a paperback and also it will be a paper, um, available open access. So it's, um, it's really a, a collaboratively authored book that sets out our, our approach and framework for the, for the project. Um, I think it has, yes, it's a manifesto there, but it's kind of how we, um, we wrote it. Um, but um, yeah, if you're interested, um, please check out the, the MIT Press book page and um, have a look at, at the work and um, maybe you can purchase it for your own institution. Um, so that's, uh, I think I, that's my, presentation and I'm very happy to take questions now or you can contact me um, on email or, or Twitter. Thanks very much, Katie. Very interesting presentation. We have a few questions in the chat and also in the Q&A. So let's um, take uh, the question from David Prosser first. Uh, so um, you have a fall of the green uh, the percentage of the green open access in your, you have seen this uh, animation for 2020, and he's asking if this is an artifact of embargoes, um, basically a lack of <laughs> availability in repositories, which has been yes, observed. Yes, that, that's right, David. That's what we think it is due to the, the, the embargo. Um, so a lot of journals have an embargo, you know, 12 months um, or so that before and I, before um, a, a paper can be deposited in a repository. So yeah, that, that is what we would attribute that to, that's right. Yeah. Okay, let's move to the next one. So Neil is um, asking if you have observed, uncovered correlations between policies and um, yeah, the, the numbers you have been <laughs> observing in terms of availability, yeah. openness. Um, Yes, no, that's a that's a great Diversity. question. Um, we, do, yeah. we, we do have a paper on that. One of the papers that's in the um, the list, uh, if I can find it again. <laughs> um, can I go back to my, yeah, I'll just go back. Um, one of the papers here, it's, um, um, yeah, meta research. So 2020, evaluating the impact of open access policies on research institutions. Um, that's Huang et al. Et al. That's all, all of us, Carl Huang. Um, that's where we, we do look at the, you know, the impact of policies. It's very, it is a very interesting question. So yeah, good mm -hmm. question. Thank you. And then um, again, another question on, on diversity. Um, you have this dashboard. I mean, is there, efforts also to, um, I mean, instruct academics on, <laughs> I mean, they, they use uh, metrics often in a very strange and oversimplified simplified way. Uh, can this, uh, what you are producing, help educating them? And... <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, again, a very, very good question. Um, yeah, how do you, okay. Yeah. Um, 
we 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 just present this information and we as I said, often people are quite surprised um, to to see that they they don't know the the activist the statistics in their uh, in their in their institution, um, even though there's a publicly available data. Um, and so it's just yes, yeah, it's a case of, of bringing this to the right to the attention, uh, bringing it into people's visibility, and that's really what we we aim to do. So I, I should mention also that. Um, I just focused on gender in in this um, because gender we have found gender data is available for almost every country in the world, but we also look at um, what I call origin data, which is ethnicity, race, homogeneity. Mm. That's very interesting as well. Um, not available from every country. Obviously, it depends on the on the country. Um, we also are, inter are interested in disability data, but again, that is recorded in very few countries um, um, publicly. And I mean, there are reasons, there are problems with, uh, there are reasons for that as well. Not everyone wants to um, divulge that kind of information, but it's it's also interesting to look at what is gathered um, on a global, on global scale, um, what kind of diversity data is. So um, yeah, we, we, we choose gender because that's pretty well available everywhere, um, but yes, Bring it to people's attention. <laughs> yeah, and you're also looking into a matching research outputs in terms of gender or perhaps diversity. Uh, yes, we are working on correlations. Yeah, we haven't. That's our. That's a sort of a, a, a future a, a project that yeah. we're working on. We're still developing that. Yeah, looking at those kind of correlations. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Good. Thank you very much again. And then let's move on to to Neil presenting on data citations and what roles. For libraries are in there. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'm just going to share my slides. All right. Hopefully you can see my slides. Give me a thumbs up if you can. Excellent. Um, so uh, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Neil Chu Hong. Um, I am director of the Software Sustainability Institute and based at the University of Edinburgh. Uh, and my co authors on this. So abstract were Jez Cope from the British Library, Patricia Hertwig from the University of Edinburgh, Dan Katz from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, and Simon Worthington from TIB. And we also acknowledge the much wider community um, of work that has been done by the Force 11 Software Citation Implementation Working Group towards what I'm going to be presenting. So I'm going to be talking about software, and in particular, how we recognize the value of software and going on to talk about how research libraries can help the adoption of software citation and more generally some of the other policies which are around software as some of the previous speakers have have mentioned open science and open knowledge and also fair and findable accessible interoperable and reusable and all of these things are wrapped up in what we need to do to support researchers who are working uh, to do their research because of the wide variety of tools that are used in the ecosystem. And it's all interlinked, the data, the papers, the publications, the monographs, and the software and the models. So to start with, I thought I would give you a quick overview of um, where we are in terms of software and its relation to research. Uh, so some work that we did at the Software Sustainability Institute now about seven years ago was to go out and survey researchers at different universities in the UK to find out what their relationship with software was. And in particular, we asked them a question around whether they would be able to do their work without using specialist software. And one of the results that came back there is that almost seven out of 10 said they wouldn't be able to do their work at all without the use of specialist software. Uh, and the software varies, as you'll see, um, but I think it's important to recognize that now in modern research, almost everyone uses software at some point in the uh, creation of data, processing of data, publishing of data, or visualization of data. Same is true if you look at analysis done um, by Nangia and Katz in 2017, if you looked at 40 nature papers there, um, they had identified uh, 32 of them which mentioned software and in nature papers there are a large number of software mentions as part of the experimental methodology 211 mentions in total across those 32 papers 
More recently, um, James Harrison and his team have been looking at publications in biomedicine and economics. Uh, so going into some of the, uh, what you may consider less uh, traditional software users. And again, there are a huge number of software mentions there. Um, closer to home, we're in the middle of um, a COVID-19 pandemic, and there's been work done by uh, the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative to see how software is being used to do research into COVID-19. Uh, and it's clear again that a large number of different software packages are being used to um, study COVID-19. So here is some work to uh, reinterpret the results that Wade and Williams got earlier this year uh, to identify, um, in this case, whether the software was proprietary software um, or open source software. Um, and it's important to see that a lot of this is, is um, still not necessarily open source software. Uh, but in both cases, I think it's important to recognize that there's been a valuable contribution that software, whether it be commercial, closed source, um, or open source uh, in the research process. So what's the challenge that we have? Um, the main one is that software is often indirectly referenced or mentioned in publications. Work by James Harrison and Julia Bullard in 2016 looked at the way in which software is mentioned in different types of publications. And so they broke it down into a number of different types. Sometimes you see software being mentioned as a reference to some associated literature. That might be a publication uh, that is describing the software. Uh, it might be to things like documentation or to project websites. It can also be referenced in a different way, which is to do with um, the way that we tend to reference other types of uh, um, parts of the, the uh, research ecosystem, like instruments or um, processes and methods. The challenge we have here is that our scholarly um, bibliometric system is really based around the idea of having identifiers that allow us to easily assign credit and to create related references. And a lot of these different types of mentions of software, it's very hard to do this, particularly if that mention is in the text of the publication. So it's just a URL in text or a footnote, um, or it's just the name of the software uh, as part of the, um, uh, of the narrative without any um, specific identifier. So without those sorts of identifiers, um, it's very hard to track the usage of software. Uh, and even if there are identifiers, it tends to be to something which is a related object, a publication, for instance. So it's, it's hard to necessarily give credit to the right people when we're um, looking at software mentions. Oh, well, yeah, um, my slides are stuck slightly. Let's see if that works. Okay. So um, hopefully you can see a slide there that says the value of citing software. Um, so what we've been looking at in the software citation working group is uh, trying to understand why people cite and why people should be citing software. And we think that people should be citing software for four reasons. One is that it supports proper attribution and credit. So as I mentioned, a challenge of referencing or mentioning a paper that's associated with the um, software is that the authorship of the software and the authorship of the publication may be different. Um, commonly, for instance, uh, software developers who have created the software will not be mentioned on the academic publication, uh, even though they uh, provided the major contribution to the code. Uh, second reason is it supports peer review uh, and it supports the val uh, validation, transparency and reproducibility of findings. So this is part of the research method. We want to be able to understand uh, how uh, the results were identified, and we want to be sure that uh, the quality of the results, the ability to validate and verify them uh, is there. And then there are two others which I think are speaking to what some of the other presenters in this session have been talking about, which is about supporting collaboration, reuse, uh, and building on the work of others. Because I think if we are to do research properly and to do it for the sake of the community uh, and addressing different types of societal challenges, 
we have to be able to build on the work of others. Uh, and certainly in terms of uh, what we've seen with COVID-19 research, this has been true. We have gone faster when we've had knowledge that is open and we've gone faster when we've known how to find and access that knowledge. And that is true of software as well. The big difference typically between software and other forms of academic output is that software is often um, what I call self-published. There are generally not repositories that people are asked to publish um, software into. There are generally um, not catalogs where you can find the software. Uh, it is um, very much the case that we are still in the, uh, in the kind of scheme where people are releasing software themselves. Where we have seen changes is that previously we would have just seen software published on someone's personal website. And now a lot more people are using third party repositories such as GitHub, GitLab and Bitbucket um, or occasionally their own university infrastructure as well where that's provided. So what we see though is that software is very federated. Um, it can appear in many different places uh, and potentially they uh, are not infrastructure that give it identifies. So the Software Citation Implementation Working Group and its precursor, the Software Citation Working Group, um, were set up to uh, try and understand what the value of software citation was and encourage people to adopt different principles that will help in terms of uh, making software citable. It started off in 2015, bringing together a large number of um, members of the community, including researchers, developers, publishers, repositories and librarians. And starting with the work that had been done by the data citation uh, working group, what we've done is take that and understand what the differences are between data citation and software citation and create a set of principles and a set of guidance to help people adopt software citation. And now that we're in 2021, uh, we have a number of different pieces of guidance, uh, which I'll explain in the following slides, uh, and importantly, a set of different early adopters looking to see how we can um, ensure that the adoption of software citation increases. So the software citation principles themselves uh, are really around why we want people to um, cite software rather than citing something else. Uh, I've mentioned the some of the reasons um, around credit and attribution um, and around ensuring that we recognize the importance of software, but there are also some things uh, that we enshrine in the principles around unique identification to ensure that we understand what software is being cited, persistence so that we ensure that the metadata is made available for um, as long as possible, accessibility to ensure that the software can be, um, be made available and specificity, which means that we can uh, ensure that uh, software citations as much as possible can facilitate the identification of a particular version of software that was used. Uh, so these software citation principles are set out in a paper that's been published in PRJ. Uh, and when we published this, we felt that um, it, was, uh, it was kind of job over. You know, we published the, the principles everyone can read them. Um, so our work was done there. But obviously, as all of you as practitioners know, uh, there's a long way from theory to practice. And so what we've been aiming to do over the last three years is understand how to make these principles um, usable, implementable and adoptable. So what we've been doing is trying to create guidelines. Um, one piece of work that was published earlier this year is software citation um, guidance and in particular uh, a set of different pieces of metadata that we think are important to include in the software citation. These include things like the, the creator, the authors of the software, the title, the date and an identifier. Um, and I think the main thing here to, to um, remember here is that we are trying to encourage people to cite the software directly. In many cases, authors will also want to have an article cited because that is something um, which is uh, the traditional means of getting credit. 
but we're trying to encourage people to cite the software itself so that we can uh, ensure that software becomes a part of the ecosystem, much as um, the first presentation was encouraging uh, data to become uh, a bigger part of the ecosystem. Uh, we've had a lot of community buy-in from here. Uh, this is the author list for the uh, paper that has the, that guidance in it, uh, and it includes a lot of representatives both from journals and from publishers, but also from libraries and librarians. And this is, I think, where we are now in terms of the software citation guidelines. Um, uh, we have got to a point where there's a lot of guidance available in terms of um, checklists for authors and for software developers, uh, but also an increasingly large number of publishers who are um, providing interpretations of this guidance as part of their guidance to authors. So what we're seeing now is an adoption from publishers and journals uh, in terms of uh, the way that they're incorporating software citation into their policies. Um, if you'd like to check out some of these different policies, uh, Chorus, which represents a large body of different publishers, uh, has been listing the publishers who now have explicit policies and software citation um, on their dashboard. Uh, and that includes uh, some of the larger open access um, journals such as eLife, PLOS, F1000 Research, as well as, as some of the larger traditional publishers such as Elsevier and Spring and Asia, and the professional societies, um, so the American Meteorological Society and the American Geophysical Union. So what does that look like in practice? Um, I'm not going to go into this in great detail, but the guidance that we provide looks at different ways of um, citing software and gives examples that can be used by the publishers and by um, others to show the different ways and types of software that might be cited. Uh, so in this case, we normally see software being cited in two particular parts of a, um, of a publication in, in a discussion of related work or a literature review where what the author is trying to do is compare different approaches that might be taken and then a methodology section where they're describing the work they've done and the part and role that software has played in it. And I think again here, I'll stress that uh, we're asking people to really cite any piece of software which has had a specific uh, part to play in the research that they've done. So it's something, it's something where you're wanting to recognize the work. So we're not asking people to cite, for instance, the word processing, um, uh, program that they're using to create the manuscript, but we are asking them to cite uh, things that they've used in the processing of the data that would be required by others to go along and reproduce that result. Okay, um, apologies here. I'm having some difficulties with the Google Slides advancing, and so there's a little bit of slowdown. So I'll just keep on talking uh, with what I believe is going to be the next slide, uh, which is around um, making sure that this guidance is available to people through research libraries. Um, so in this case, uh, what are the role of research libraries? Um, I think that the role of research libraries are twofold. Um, one is to support and train researchers in terms of the correct ways to uh, both cite software but also to include software as part of other parts of the, um, the general ecosystem. So that includes things like data management and, and research outlet management plans, how they publish software and get PIDs, and also how they might use reference managers to support the way that they are collecting the software that they use. The other role of research libraries is in the provision of infrastructure, and that's both to help support software citation and open access to software as part of the repositories that they already provide. So that might be in the digital repositories and um, catalogs, but also to work with different groups to ensure that there is proper um, guidance uh, on how to use the wider set of infrastructure. Uh, so things like Datacite um, 
to ensure that the guidance that they're providing is as consistent as possible so that when researchers move from institution to institution uh, that can um, that information is readily translatable and there are some good examples of this in, in practice um, in particular the MIT libraries have a great guide on both citing and publishing software and we've seen a number of different workshops being run um, to look at in particular how FAIR um, and FAIR data and software overlap with software citation. We've also seen integration and in infrastructure to do with uh, how we make it easier to make code um, citable and to publish software, such as um, Caltech doing some integration to make it easier to um, uh, do author lists as part of their wider um, work to make it easy to deposit code that is in GitHub into their repositories. And finally, I'd like to highlight um, a document on uh, nine best practices for research software registries and repositories, where a number of different um, repositories, including a number of research library digital repository managers, got together to understand what the wider best practice was for research library infrastructure around software, including things like retention and scope policies. So this is an example of the MIT libraries. Um, uh, guidance and I think what's really useful to understand in this is to see how succinct it is. Uh, it's not a large um, set of guidance, it's very short and to the point. Um, the second half of this page provides some examples in different types of formats so people can see the different ways in which software are cited. So just to finish off, um, what do I think are the next steps for this community? Uh, so I think the main one is to understand that publisher and repository support for software citation is progressing rapidly. We're seeing the policies being picked up by uh, different publishers, and this is now filtering down to the journal editors, who in turn are starting to provide guidance to both the pub um, publication teams and to their reviewers on what they expect to see in terms of citation around code and software and tools. So to facilitate adoption and to make sure that researchers that are being supported by research libraries are um, uh, supported properly, it's essential that the guidance that's being provided is be consistent. And one question I have for the audience is basically, what do you need from us as the Software Citation Implementation Group uh, to help you achieve this? So what, what would be the things that you require to help make your guidance um, fit in with your existing guidance and make it consistent with uh, guidance on software citation and publishing from other libraries. And I think the second thing to highlight is that this is an opportunity for research libraries to collaborate with other groups within their own institutions. In particular, over the last 10 years, there's been a growth in um, something called research software engineering and research computing groups. And these are specialist groups within institutions that are there to support the people, the researchers who are developing the software that will be cited and published. Uh, a lot of these groups are involved in training within these institutions. And I think there's a role for research libraries to collaborate with research software engineering groups to provide broader support for open research, um, fair research objects, and more generally reproducibility um, and software preservation as well. So um, I'm going to stop just now. Apologies for some of the slides sticking at times uh, and I'll hand back to um, Birgit. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much, Neil. So we have a question. Uh, Miriam is asking uh, in terms of the definition, what should we consider a software? Because there are of course also scripts and notebooks out there. Um, is this all included or <laughs> yeah uh, some some consider this as documentation and you know but it's of course emerging also from the side of publishers that you that's that's a really good um, question and i think one of the things that we've been considering as we talk to the different journal editors in particular is that different communities may have slightly different norms about where something fits uh so um for some uh, processing scripts are seen as being um, private and they're just part of the sort of preliminary work. 
uh, and once you've got to a, uh, a process data set, you're then talking just about the, the software that's being used to analyze that. Um, in other communities, uh, there, are, there are guidance around making sure that those scripts themselves are being published um, and whether those are published as part of the data set or as part of um, the software package. I think this is going to get more complicated. We have things like executable notebooks, which naturally blur the distinction between them. And I think um, the, the main thing that we're encouraging is that people publish and make these citable. Uh, and we'll probably be able to work a lot of this out as we go. Um, I think that the, the key thing here is to, to, to work within your community, to work out the norms of where this should be um, uh, put together. And if that's part of the data set as part of a larger package, um, as long as you're able to identify that there are scripts within that package, uh, then what we've done is achieve the goals of the software citation principles. Yeah, we might, of course, run into follow up issues when you publish such notebooks, <laughs> but to maintain this over time, but anyway. Mm. Questions we receive when we discuss software is as often, of course, the licensing question. I mean, which is not um, so obvious always to researchers if they are really a, can they share <laughs> in terms of who owns what they have produced. Is there guidance on this as well in your guides? I mean, in the yeah. Um, so I think this is part of the, the sort of wider set of, of guidance um, that's not specifically around software citation. Um, so the software citation guidance says that you should also be citing um, important pieces of uh, closed source and proprietary software that are being used. Mm -hmm. And um, in the same way as we're able to cite uh, open access publications and we're able to cite uh, um, kind of uh, closed publications as well, we can do the same thing for software. But more generally for uh, software publishing, as opposed to citation and guidance for, uh, for authors who may be looking to publish their own software um, or to share software that's uh, being produced by collaborators, there's an increasing set of guidance on software licensing that is mm. out there, uh, quite often driven by the um, research offices in universities. Um, and I'm happy to point people to, to different um, resources for this. Uh, this is this is one of the parts of work that I do um, in my other role is to provide um, guidance on software licensing. I think the big thing there here is um, traditionally there wasn't very much support to help people identify what the best license was and there might maybe wasn't as much um, understanding within a university about the different options for licensing and that I think is also changing as open source licensing becomes uh, a more suitable or, or is seen as a more suitable way of exploiting research outputs than simply trying to license them and get a, a commercial use fee from them. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have another question to uh, Katie on uh, if you're looking into the subset of potentially predatory <laughs> publishers as well. Uh, I think you put some note there but if you would like to add um i, I think that's probably one that i <laughs> that i think i'll leave up to to katie for that yeah 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 um, katie katie i was just referring to you because um thank yeah. you again neil i mean we could um have now uh, a few minutes left or if there are other questions um, I'll just answer. Yeah, thank you. It's a good mm -hmm. question and we are aware of that um one of our uh, research associates who's um uh, located in Africa is in, uh, doing some work on this with us. So it is, it is a, um, yeah, it's certainly something that may inflate <laughs> the yeah. um, statistics for, for some parts of the world. So yes, it's, it's something. But a general issue here that there's no reference list, of course. I mean, you don't, it's hard to say, is it in or out? <laughs> you know, was it at this point in time in when you have this yeah. publication? It's not a... Yeah, and it certainly is is an issue uh, for researchers in 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 Africa to and Asia. Yeah, um, and policies just um, um, yeah, <laughs> we don't really know what 
what goes on. I mean, there may be policies, but what what are the practices? And that's sometimes harder to mm. harder to uh, uh, to uh, uncover. Um, yeah. So, good question. Thank you. Uh, Neil, is there anything like a software citation index thingy coming up, or <laughs> is anyone? Uh, sorry, could you repeat? Uh, the software question? citation. I mean, there are indices for all kinds of outputs. I mean, but is it for a software um, thing which uh, exists somewhere or is in the minds of some people? I mean, when research, I mean, the publishers coming up with some guidance, they might have this in their back of their heads as well. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so it's really interesting. Um, there's been work done uh, by the, the Freya project um, on, on basically different types of dashboards for other sorts of it, uh, outputs. And so that's maybe one of the first sort of building blocks towards um, a, a software citation mm. index. Um, I think the biggest challenge we have is that, uh, as I mentioned, so little software is directly cited um, and an even smaller proportion of that is directly cited with an identifier. Yep. So it's quite hard to build these sorts of um, indices until the the sort of the practice shifts. And that's that's partly why we're we're doing this work is to um, not it's not to directly enable these sort of indexes to to be created. There's always there's always a worry that in in um, creating something that makes it easy to um, build metrics that those metrics are used wrongly uh, but i think without that kind of ability to see the relations and the knowledge relations that would be required uh, we are we're missing out a little bit on understanding uh, how how different software supports different aspects of research so i, I think the answer is not yet but i could imagine that yeah. To be done in the future uh, and I know of a number of groups who are starting to work towards some of the foundations of that. Yeah at least there are some data sets which have this as a subset also I mean open air also like you can't have <laughs> this information and Curtin might have some <laughs> so okay so is there anything else in the chat let me have a look. I mean, the conversation between Nicolas and um, Jess, I cannot really follow. If you would like to comment on this, Nicolas, please do. Oh, no, there is this uh, big project. It's uh, uh, about a repository of software, which name is Software Heritage Foundation. So, and they have this type of uh, identifiers because I discussed a lot about that uh, with uh, the, from the director of the Software Heritage. So I was wondering if was if was relationship between this initiative and uh, software heritage, but apparently yes. <laughs> yes, uh, there is, and I, I think a related thing is that there's a group within publishers called Jats Farrar, um, which looks at the metadata that's used in the publication process uh, of articles, and um, we've been working with them on software citation and understanding the role of, uh, so software heritage is, it's a bit like internet archive for, uh, for software. Um, and in the same way that a lot of citations now to more transient articles are linking to a archive.org URL. Um, we're working with the JATS for our group to understand how we might ensure that um, the metadata is not lost or corrupted um, if we are linking to a software heritage um, uh, identifier. So, so it's an alternative way of citing software where we're going to an archive rather than directly to the object itself. Okay, I think we are coming to an end. Thank you again um, for your excellent presentations and the audience for being with us today and your questions. Hope to see you in person sometime in the future, but <laughs> uh, and enjoy the uh, other sessions of the conference and let's keep in touch. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Bye. Bye bye.